Oops. Good morning. Good morning, Dale. That's better. He's ah, there we go. Wow, what a week. I thought, I thought, right before Christmas, we should have just kind of a short little message on a verse that everybody already knows, and we'd all identify with it and leave feeling somewhat better about the season we're in. Because Christmas gets a little hectic, if you haven't noticed. Gets a little busy, and you start thinking, man, I want to focus on the reason for the season, and I want to have my priorities right, but man, it's busy, and I feel weary. So let's do, right after the second time, Jesus, right last week we, we, we talked about the healing of the woman who had had the the bleeding for 12 years, and then he healed the little girl, 12 years old. He ra res raised her up. And um, right after that, because John the Baptist knew that one of the main messianic signs was that the dead would be raised. So John sends his disciples, said, are you the one? And they go through the whole thing again, like, yes, but you're not getting out of prison, and so on. And so then right after that, he <coughs> talks about this verse, come unto me, uh, it's Matthew 28, or it's Matthew 11, 28 and 29, come unto me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. That seemed like a good Christmas verse. Uh, our fourth candle of the Advent is peace, right before Christmas, the peace candle. We started with hope. And we talked about the people who came to Jesus and the hope that they had because they had hit bottom. And then the next week was um, faith. And Jesus uh, healed people and said, uh, your faith has made you well because of your faith. And we talked about every time somebody, Jesus said that to people, you're, because of your faith, your sins are forgiven. Because of the faith of your friends, because of your faith, there's something they said that indicated they recognized him as the Messiah. Uh, and then um, last week, the candle was um, joy. And while that woman felt when the, her bleeding stopped because she reached out and touched the tassel, of the Messiah because she believed the verse that said there will be healing in the wings of the Messiah. And he said, woman, your faith has made you well. And, um, and then John the Baptist comes, asks a question, and then in Matthew um, 11, verse 28, he says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, um, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and um, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And for my yoke is easy and my load is light. Um, and that's like, we've all heard that verse. Anybody not ever heard that verse? And I thought, okay, this will be a pretty easy message. We'll go about 10 minutes. We'll just encourage everybody, you know, when you feel weary this Christmas, Turn to him, and boy, did I have a surprise, because God says, you know something? There's a lot more here than you think there is, Dale, and let me show you. <laughs> so hang on. Uh, I thought just doing two verses, we could have a shorter sermon, but I don't think it's going to work that way. But this woman, whom the Pharisees said, she's a sinner, and she's recognized him as the Messiah because she's anointing his feet with perfume per the Old Testament prediction of um, Song of Solomon. And um, he says to her, your faith, your sins are, because of your faith, your sins are forgiven. And so then we have this, um, what I'm going to call the great invitation. I never looked at it this way before until I started looking at each individual word in this. And it starts out with come. Come unto me. Now we know we have the great commission, which is go into all the world and preach the gospel and then the great omission that we always forget to add and make disciples of all nations 
teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. The, the teaching part, often we leave that off. And so here I'm going to propose to you that we have something even greater than that verse. We have the great invitation where God is inviting you to come. And I think that's more than just symbolically or in my mind or in my heart in the moment. Um, this verse, um, this word come, and you remember I always, I always, before I do anything else, I look up that word in the Greek and then I see in the Greek version of the Old Testament where was the first place that word was used. And it was used in the creation story. It was used in the creation story when um, God formed the animals and brought one at a time to Adam and, sa and said he caused them to come to Adam. And Adam then took responsibility over them and agreed, gave them names. And when you do give them names, you accept the ownership and the responsibility and the direction of those. And then it says, um, and then later in this verse it says, for my, uh, my burden is easy and my load is light. The, the easy word there is the Hebrew word tov, which is good. And where do we keep seeing, where, where do you think uh, that word good is first used? I mean, it's all over the creation story. First day and it was good. Second day and it was good. Third day and it was good and it was good. Said it twice and goes on until he gets to the first time in scripture where he says, not good. Anybody remember what the not good was? That man should be alone. Most of us guys would agree with that. And most of you women would go, yeah, you probably shouldn't be alone. <laughs> so we're all in agreement. <laughs> so it says that God fashioned, which the Hebrew word is uh, built to specification. She made the person that would complete Adam, that together they would be complete forever. And it says, he caused her to come to him. And so I think when Jesus is making this same invitation, he's linking back to the Garden of Eden and, when, uh, and inviting us to come to him. And ironically, this week, I started a class from Hillsdale College online in, um, of Genesis. And I was astounded when we began to, the teacher began to look at the fall of Adam and Eve. And we've all read it time and time again. It said, God made Adam and Eve. They were in the garden with him, fellowshipping with him. And he said, there's only one rule, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, and then what happens? The serpent comes along, and he says, oh, has God really said? And it's, the tree looks really good, and it's good to eat, and your eyes will be opened, and you'll, you'll be like God. I mean, our ultimate goal in life is to be like Jesus, to be like God. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just pick something and eat it, and woo, I'm like Jesus now. I can determine right from wrong. I know all, I, I know what God knows. Is it possible that God didn't want them to eat of that? He wanted them to walk with him for a few thousand years and learn about right and wrong and good and evil. Not just evil, the good. If we could know all the goodness of God, our head would probably explode, wouldn't it? So is it possible that God had this original intent of walking with Adam and Eve in partnership with them and discovering good and evil together until Adam and Eve had the heart of God for the world and then they would continue to multiply in the next generation and then they could eat of that tree, perhaps. Um, but look what happened. The serpent came along and said, did God really say? And it's, scripture tells us that the woman ate of it. And then she gave it to her husband, and he ate of it. And then the next thing we know, God is, they heard the voice of God walking, as literally. God was in the garden where he usually walked with them, where they usually had conversations. But all of a sudden, they decided they were naked and afraid. And um, God 
asks the question, Adam, where are you? And I know Ken did a little video this week. I wish somebody would ask me, who, who am I and what am I doing here? Where are you? What, where are you? Where are you in life right now? Because Adam was hiding and Eve was hiding. And God says, have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to? And tell me if this is right or not. Adam immediately fell on the floor, on the ground, said, God, I've sinned. I've done a terrible thing. What have I done? You warned me. I can't believe I did this. Yeah, he said, um, it's the woman. She did it. And you gave me her. I'm good. And then he turns to the woman and said, what have you done? And she fell down and said, oh, God, I can't believe we did this. You know, the serpent came, we were tempted, and we should have asked you, and I wish we had walked longer with you. And we, No, she said, the serpent did it. It's his fault. <laughs> have you ever wondered what would have happened if they would have done the first instead of the second? And have you ever wondered in our life how many times we make excuses, and if we would do the first instead of the second, it would be a whole different scenario. And so I believe that Jesus is making the great invitation to each one of us to join him and to walk with him, to be in the yoke with him, and to learn from him, he says, and learn from me, to discover accurately right and wrong in life, and then be in a position where we can help others. And so this just hit me like, wow, Lord. And I, I agreed to help my son out by driving this heavy, heavily loaded truck into Portland. And it just hit me. I'm going, wow. And you remember the time I told you, I, I prayed to God, please, please give me a real life uh, example that, would, that I could use to teach my children the lessons of ownership. And I walked out the door and my truck had been stolen. Okay, I made that mistake again. I, uh, I said, Lord, I wish there was some way that, I mean, this is so cool, that I could fully realize this and be able to explain it to others. And I checked my mirror, and the traffic stopped in front of me. And when I turned around, there was a van in my windshield. And I hit, I, it, would, it was impossible for me to get stopped, but the van stopped. I mean, the truck stopped. I didn't hit it. I'm thinking, wow, that was pretty quickly answered prayer. That wasn't so bad. I'll remember that, Lord. You, you, you take care of me, no problem. 30 seconds later, I turn onto the freeway. Cars going everywhere. Boom, my front tire blows out. Shrapnel going everywhere. Kaboom, 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 you know. I'm going, oh. all right, now I'm getting into the weary portion of this verse, I need help because I got no place to go. I, there is no place to pull a truck over on 205 near Oregon City. And somehow the rubber stayed on the wheel that I could go slow enough to get to the off ramp and there was a nice place to park there. Triple A won't tow a heavy uh, loaded truck, so Les Schwab, yeah, we have that tire, we can be there in a half hour came, put the tire on, I'm going, oh, Lord, this is great, thank you. I was weary, you came along, tightens the last two bolts down and they shear off. <laughs> uh, I'm still not learning, am I? I'm still, <laughs> I'm still not learning. And um, he goes, no problem, I'll call the store, we'll limp you back up there. No less swabs anywhere have the lug bolts for an Isuzu truck. Oh, great. Napa, he calls them. Nope, Napas don't carry those. All right, Lord, what are we going to do? This thing is loaded. Two of the six lug nuts are broke off. Just, okay, we'll call the FMI, the truck dealer that works on Isuzus. Oh, okay. And I, he goes, Ah, man, I wouldn't drive it. If you can get it here, we could probably take care of it next week. Well, the truck's loaded, and there's this plan, and, and I, 
he said, and I would replace all six. I said, well, do you have them? Well, funny thing, I have six in stock. Okay, um, could I come get them and have somebody put them in? You come on down, I'll squeeze you in. 13 minutes later, I'm at the FMI dealer. 30 minutes later, I'm driving away with all new lugs in my wheel, and I'm thinking, that is a miracle, God. You did good. I get it. Next time I'm weary, I'm turning to you first before I wallow in my misery for a few days or whatever. So that was my real-life example this week. Barb asked me, huh? so did you learn anything this week? Oh, man. Funny you should ask. If overcame anything. I didn't, but God was good because I came unto him and he gave me rest, gave me peace in that situation. So if we could, I'd like to look at what I'm calling a great invitation, the calm, the calm that was in the garden. Is it possible that Jesus came to be the second Adam to restore what um, happened when Adam and Eve said, wasn't me? to start over with mankind and say, come to me and I'll give you rest because it's that word rest. Guess where? First place used. Shalom. God rested. God didn't need to rest after creation on the seventh day. God stopped to enjoy creation. And he invites us to join him to do that. And Jesus said, come to me, all you're weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's like, okay, we're starting over here. Paradise restored, the restoration of all things, the the new beginnings, the eighth year. But we always talk about, and how many times have we said, um, oh, I've got too much on my plate, or um, this load is too heavy for me to carry? Um, Because the invitation is to those people. That's us. Come to me, who? All you who are weary and heavy laden. Okay, weary. Where's the first place that's used in scripture? And I was so surprised when I found out that as the Israelites were leaving Egypt and heading out, as we know, the tribe of Judah led, and the last tribe was the tribe of Dan, if you read the order. And they're heading out, and some of the people started getting weary and falling behind. And I remember being in um, Israel, and we were on this trip with this crazy rabbi guy that I told you about that cooked us in 120 degrees and then dived into into an oasis. Well, first day, and it turned out that there was this, they were all, he, um, to travel with him, you gotta be able to convince him that you can keep up, because he, and this was the two water bottle day, take a gallon of water with you. but there was an older couple that had won the trip in a raffle. And they were in their 70s. And they couldn't keep up, maybe close to 80. And first stop, off the bus, he tells the story of the Amalekites. He said, when the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, and the weary, and the sick, and the lame couldn't keep up, The last tribe, the tribe of Dan, was supposed to help them and protect the rear guard. They didn't. They left them behind. And the Amalekites came and picked them off. And if you'll read in Scripture, God wanted the Amalekites completely wiped out after that. That's from Deuteronomy. um, From Deuteronomy 25. 25.18, and how he met you along the way, talking about the Amalekites, and attacked attacked you, all the stragglers at your rear when you were faint and weary, and he did not fear God. And then it goes on to say, when you enter the land and you enter your rest, destroy the Amalekites. God does not have any mercy for those who do not have mercy on the poor and the weary and the weak and the disadvantaged and don't walk past them. (laughs) But anyway, he tells the story, and then he takes off as fast as he can walk, and everybody's, everybody's, every man for himself. (laughs) And Cheryl's struggling because emotionally, when you go to Israel, everybody reacts different, and she's in Israel, and she's in the places, and she's going, this is just overwhelming me. 
and I'm trying to help her along, and then these older people get, um, oh, and he, and he went on to say, now the tribe of Dan, you notice they're not mentioned in Revelation, because he said, I think it's because they didn't help the stragglers and the weary and the disadvantage. In fact, they didn't even go to the allotted land that God gave them. They tried and couldn't drive out the Philistines, so they went up north, uh, to, to the, and that's the tribe of Dan, and that's where they set up the altar to worship Baal later in history. So don't be like the tribe of Dan. And then he takes off. And we're helping the stragglers out, okay? And we get uh, about a mile up this hill, and he's, he's waiting, and everybody's waiting. He goes, are we all here yet? Is everybody here yet? And he, I think it's all part of the strategy, you know, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And I'm coming carrying his pack and her pack, and I think one other young man was helping us, Karen Sherrill's. And we come up, and I said, the tribe of Dan is here. It felt quiet for a minute. He goes, oh. And he went on with his teaching. The very next morning, when we all come out before we get on the bus, he says, all right, I need four people to be the tribe of Dan today. Every day I'm going to ask for four people to be the tribe of Dan and to be the ones that come last, and you help every straggler. And I thought, oh, God, it's so good. Every trip he's ever taken since then, he appoints a tribe of Dan, and now I'm informed that many, many of the guides in Israel every morning appoint a tribe of Dan to help the stragglers. Isn't that a cool story? Yeah, that's awesome. But that's, that's the first place that was used. Come to me, all you who are weary. He has a heart for the weary. He has a heart for the stragglers. He has a heart for those who are having trouble keeping up. And that's the ones he calls. And he said, come to me if you're weary, if you can't carry the load, if your plate is full, if you feel overwhelmed, I can't go another day, I don't want to go another day, I'm, or worse, I'm thinking of suicide, I'm thinking of um, what self-medicating, th you fill in the blank. Almost 60% of pastors now surveyed say they wish they could do something else besides be a pastor. I wonder if we've missed the great invitation. And it comes in two parts. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How fun is it that tonight at 6 o'clock we are having a hymn sing and donut fry. All throughout the world, tonight at 6 o'clock, all Jewish people begin celebrating Hanukkah. And they invite people into their homes and they fry donuts to recognize the oil that didn't give out when they lit the lamp. The story is the Maccabees finally defeated the Syrians. Antiochus Epiphanes, the guy who had sacrificed the pig on the altar and tore down their temples, they finally won the battle. And they come into the temple and they restore it. And they only have one small vial of olive oil to light the, to light the um, menorah. And they lit it. And they were told it's going to take eight days to get more oil here that's the special kind of oil you need. And the story is that oil never ran out. It burned for eight days until they could bring more. And so they celebrate Hanukkah, the festival of lights. And they light lights everywhere. And tonight at 6 o'clock, they start frying donuts and olive oil to commemorate the Maccabees. And that's what we're doing here tonight at 6 o'clock. Isn't that fun? What's more fun is John 10, 22 tells us that at the feast of Hanukkah took place in Jerusalem, it was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. Now it doesn't say Hanukkah, it says the feast of dedication, which is another word for Hanukkah. So Jesus, it mentions that on Hanukkah he's in the temple walking in the portico. The first time I read that, I googled Feast of Dedication. What is it? And it came up Hanukkah. And I thought, that is, we're going back 10 years or more here, and I thought, that is really strange. And so I googled um, Feast of Dedication, and it brings me to YouTube to this guy named Dwight Pryor, and he's giving a sermon on this very text, and it's the first thing 
that turned my heart back to the Jewish Jesus. That was the beginning of the journey that made me say, okay, what's going on, Hanukkah? That's a Jewish holiday. Jesus celebrated that. Jesus was there. Later I find out, in my opinion, time-wise, Jesus was conceived on Hanukkah, the festival of lights, the light of the world. And so we can kind of celebrate that tonight as well. But what's interesting is, he's, what happens when he's there? Well, the Jews gathered around him and were saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, the Mashiach, just tell us plainly. <laughs> do you think he did? Jesus answered and said, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. What did Jesus say to the disciples when he called them? Come, come, follow me. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one, and the Judeans took up stones to stone him with. I don't think they got it. But he gave a clue here when he said, my sheep, you're not my sheep because you don't hear my voice. And one of my teachers in Israel um, was sharing how he kind of got his start. He studied in a Hebrew um, yeshiva in Jerusalem. And one of the um, assignments was to spend a week with the Bedouins. And he said he, the particular Bedouin family he went to, um, the 12-year-old daughter was, or 10-year-old daughter was in charge of the entire family fortune, the sheep. And she would take those sheep out in the morning. She'd stay with them all week, and she'd bring them back after a week. And his assignment was to go with her. Well, of course, that, to make it appropriate, the older teenage boy went with them, which was great. He said, and it was fascinating because the sheep followed her. They knew her voice, what she took, where they went. And this was great. Uh, long about evening, she took him to water. And then she put him in, took him into this great rock enclosure and closed the gate. And she said, now let's go find some shade and get our dinner. And we did. And he said, and when we came back, four other herds of sheep had come in, and they were all in there with her sheep. And he said, I worried all night. That's a family fortune. And these other herds were bigger. And they were men, shepherds. And she just lost all their sheep. And in the morning at 5 a.m., when he said, when I'm waking up, I hear this little girl get up. And she goes over to the sheep enclosure. And she pulls the, the gates, the logs away. And she comes back. And she starts calling her sheep. And every one of her sheep got up and came to her. Because in that society, the sheep know the shepherd's voice. And they have had occasions where something happened to like the little girl, and the sheep didn't know who to follow. So they always had two, like a brother also, that the sheep knew the voice. And Jesus is saying, you don't know my voice because you don't walk with me. You, um, you don't walk with me. And... And he tells the story of the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. And he talks about what shepherd, if he's lost one sheep, wouldn't leave the 99 and go find the sheep. And the, the, um, the Talmud, the legends of the Jews, it talks about Moses. When he was a shepherd, he lost one sheep. And he left the rest, and he went and found this sheep that was looking for water. And it says he picked up this sheep, and he carried it on his shoulders. And Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. So he starts, the first part of the great invitation is, come to me, you who are weary, and I will give you rest. But the second part, in fact, if you think about it, isn't this what we talked about in the Sermon on the Mount with the ashray? He comes and he gets down beside you on his hands and knees, and he says, you know, it's going to be okay. A lot of the things you're carrying, you don't need to carry. And when you're ready, I'm going to help you stand up. And then when you're ready, we're going to walk together. And then when you're ready, you're going to go and help others. Isn't that the same part of the invitation? Because the first part is come to me, return to God. 
I'll help the weary, I'll help the heavy laden. And then the second part, which we could call it the second great omission, is take my yoke upon you. Now we're talking action. In those days, if you had a young ox who didn't know anything, the quickest way to train him, and it took a long time, a year or two, yoke him in the same yoke with the old ox. And he'll kick, and he'll try to destroy the old ox, and he'll try to kick the goad, and he'll try to kick the cart, but eventually he figures out what you're supposed to do. And I think when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and walk with me because I'm gentle, I'm humble of heart. And it's how many scriptures, uh, and if I had more time, I'd go through them. I have them written down, but God, uh, Micah, he has shown the old man what is good, but to love justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Jesus is saying, you want to be like me. You want to walk. You want to work. You want to, you want to do the work of God, but you want to do it humbly and with the spirit of, of, of uh, humility. And that's why he says, come and learn from me. So it's more than an invitation when you're weary to come. It's an invitation of discipleship. It's an invitation for apprenticeship. It's an invitation to come and join Jesus every day as you walk that you're in the yoke with him. So it's more than just saying, oh, I feel better now that I read that verse because he said, come to me when you're weary and I'll get through Christmas somehow. This is much bigger than that. This is much bigger than that. This says, I want to walk with you every day, every second of the day, and I want you in the yoke with me and eventually I want you to learn to be like me. And it's like, hallelujah. He says, because my burden is not heavy and my burden is light. Um, that's part of the reason he spent three years with the disciples, isn't it? Everywhere they went, they had a little story here. Somebody threw rocks at Jesus, he turned the other cheek. Whatever, he showed them how to live the word of God every single day. It's something that God wanted to do with Adam and Eve, and they said, she did it, you did it, he did it. And God said, fine. And eventually, every man, uh, the evil of every man was so great that he destroyed mankind and started over with Noah. And out of that, he called Abraham. And out of that, um, we came up with 12 tribes. And out of the tribe of Judah, we got King David. And out of uh, King David's lineage, he sent his son. You always hear me talk about um, first usage. And I always have mentioned before, first usage of the word love is when God told Abraham to take your son, whom you love, and go to the place I will show you and sacrifice him. Wow. And how Abraham was obedient and Abraham went. And the Jewish uh, understanding is that Isaac was in his late 20s. He carried his own wood to the place on Mount Moriah that God took him. And it was a three days journey. And he willingly laid down on the stone. And when Abraham raised the knife, God says, stop. And he provided a lamb with his head caught in the thickets in place of Isaac. That's the first place love is used. Guess where the first place love is used in all four gospels? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's at the baptism of Jesus and God says, this is my son whom I love and in whom I delight. And in John, the first place is, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son, gave his beloved son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the love relationship that Jesus came to restore to each and every one of us. And so it's an invitation to walk with him. I've told you that I looked up the curriculum in the Bible schools and in the seminaries, and there's one class on the Gospels out of four years, six years, one class. 
how in the world are you going to learn to look like Jesus and be like Jesus and walk like Jesus and encounter everything unless it's every day, every day, every day? And so my admonition is to find someone who is, has walked that walk and can help you walk that walk. We all need that no matter how old we are. There's somebody that can show us how to be more like Jesus in situations. Um, and so that was the invitation. Come to me and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. Uh, whoops. So Jesus accused the Pharisees of putting too heavy a burden on, um, on the Jewish people. In fact, um, more than they could bear. Too heavy, too weighty. Do as they say, but not as they do. And um, that reminded me of this. Uh, poor donkey. The load got a little heavy. Jesus said uh, to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, uh, the Torah scholars and the Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses. Now, the seat of Moses was the seat in front of the synagogue. And the person who stood up to read, like Jesus did in the Nazareth synagogue, would then go over to the seat of Moses and sit down and teach. So this is a way of saying they sit in your synagogues and they teach. And if we ever go to Chorazin, there's a synagogue there and there's a seat of Moses that you can sit in and have your picture taken. But, um, and they tell you, what, so whatever they tell you to do and observe, uh, do not do what they do. For they say, uh, for what they say, they don't even do. But they tie up heavy loads, hard to carry, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. And all their works they do to be noticed by men, they make their tefillin, that's their tassel, or their, um, the box they put the scripture in, um, wide. And their tzitzit, their tassels, they make them long. One guy they drug on the ground. Um, they love the place of honor at feasts, the best seats in the synagogue. Greetings in the marketplace, rabbi! They love to be called rabbi by men. That's the heavy loads. What did he say about his load? His load was easy, and his load was light. He invites us to do more than just say, oh, I'm weary, thank you, Lord, for giving me comfort today. He invites us to get in the yoke with him. Every single thing we do, every day, every breath we take, every person we encounter, somehow he wants to be there to show us how, what, how he would handle the situation. And I'll tell you, I fail repeatedly. But he wants us to be in the yoke with him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Come, and I will give you rest. He said to them, here is rest. Give rest to the weary, and here is repose. But they wouldn't listen. This is out of Isaiah 28, 12. Jesus has to sneak in another little teaching to this generation is about to be destroyed if they don't turn and repent and turn to him. This generation is doing the same thing um, in the days of the master that Adam and Eve did, saying, it's his fault, it's his fault, it's her fault. It's that refusing to repent, refusing to fall at the feet of the master and say, I have messed up. We have messed up. We have to do better. And so Jesus is, or God is saying in Isaiah 28, 12 to the people, um, I want to give you rest. I want to come and give you rest. And it says that they didn't listen to him. They wouldn't listen to him. They didn't want his rest. And I think we're in a society today that's decided they don't want God any longer. They don't need God any longer. We have our iPhones. We have our electronics. We spend, I have the statistics, it's something like eight hours a day, every person on their electronics. That's what we do when we're weary. What would we look like if we spent that many hours reading the Gospels and, and trying to understand the Jewish Jesus and his culture and his geography and his links? And it would be wonderful. And so I just kind of picture God as this lion going, there's coming a day when I'm, I have to destroy the generation of those who wouldn't accept me. Just like Adam and Eve were banished from the garden and the angels were there to guard it. And we had angels that came that day 2,000 years ago. And they came when the baby was born in the manger and the shepherds were out in the fields. And I don't know if, 
it's unusual to be out in the fields at night. I think perhaps they were giving this poor young woman uh, a shelter place and keeping their sheep out. And the angels came to surround them and said, um, and this will be a sign for you. Everywhere it says in scripture, this will be a sign. The next thing the person did was go see the sign. Mary was told, this will be a sign for you. Your cousin Elizabeth is six months pregnant. Boom. Next thing she's going to see. Me. And I think that was on Hanukkah as well, because I think that's when the master was conceived. And then three months later, she comes home with the pilgrims. But this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, swaddling clothes like a human baby would be, loved by Mary, placed in a feeding trough, and um, lying in a manger. And then suddenly there appeared with that angel a multitude of angels saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, shalom, peace, rest among men with whom he is pleased. I think this is an invitation this Christmas for you to join the master in walking with him and experiencing the restoration of all things seeing paradise lost, paradise returned individually with us as we're yoked with the master and corporately as we are the bride of Christ, as God asked Eve to come to Adam, he's asking us to come to Jesus like the bride. And he's humble. And we can, I think more than anything, that humble and gentle means we can trust him. We're not getting set up for failure here. We're not being deceived. It's not this angry God that just wants to burn us up, but Jesus won't let him. This is the love of the Father come back to us by sending his Son, whom he loves for us. So on earth, peace among men. And I just pray, that would be my prayer, that this Christmas somehow we'll always remember the great invitation. I hope that we never forget the great invitation that he made to us to come to him when we're weary and then when we feel better and when we're stronger to get in the yoke with him and walk with him as he restores all things and ushers his kingdom in. And we get to do that until the end of time when the final rest will come. That was what I got out of one short verse. <laughs> Next Sunday is Christmas morning. We're just going to have the Christmas story and some wonderful songs in two weeks. The New Year's message is going to be Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem and the crippled man was laying there and the story of the crippled man who couldn't get up and go. So let me pray. Father, thank you for this Christmas season. Thank you for the festival of lights and the fact that even though we didn't know it, you've invited us to come and join you in that tonight and your people and the Jewish people. Lord, your son was the light of the world. And he came to bring us hope and faith and joy and peace. And Father, can we also be that light that draws light from that first lamp and be light in the world and experience the peace of the world as you did as you walked in it. And we just pray your blessing upon this day and this season. In Jesus' name, amen.